want to welcome everyone this morning as we come to uh, worship the Lord. We do have a number of announcements to make. Uh, first of those is you can discard your, your September calendar, pick up a new one because it's been revised. Uh, this is from Jean Obers. She says, to my dear church family, I want to thank you for the lovely 85th birthday dessert party. The kind words, gifts, and many other expressions of love were so appreciated and truly warmed my heart. Much love to all of you, Jean Obers. We, get, we have, have a letter from Brian and Susan Fry, our missionaries that we support in Papua New Guinea. And they, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to read part of that. Dear friends and family, August 26 marks 16 years since we arrived in Papua New Guinea as newlyweds. We cannot thank you enough for walking together with us through this exciting, humbling, and sometimes difficult, but always good journey that God calls us to. You provided for our physical and spiritual needs through generous giving and faithful prayers. You've surprised us at every turn with your help and encouragement in very practical ways. Many of you have been our partners since day one, and many have joined somewhere along the way. We would not have been have played the roles that we have in the ministry of translating God's word into the languages of Papua New Guinea without you sending us. Thank you. We have reached the decision that it's time to end our ministry in Papua New Guinea. We will officially resign from Wycliffe Bible Translators effective October 31st. The decision is something that we have been prayerfully considering for the last 18 months process that includes seeking counsel from close friends, colleagues, and family. We want you to know that this decision was not made as a result of trauma, conflict with people, or with our organization. We are in good health and have steady financial support, and will strongly believe in the ministry, and still strongly believe in the ministry of Bible translation and the work done by Wycliffe. We love Papua New Guinea dearly, and the decision to leave has been one of the hardest things we've ever done, and it was not taken lightly. God has been very good to us and has provided clear next steps for our family. Brian has accepted a job offer with the U.S. Foreign Service, where he will be working as a facility manager at the U.S. embassies overseas. So... Anyway, I'm going to put, we'll post this in the back. There's more, um, and, but we just need to be praying for Brian and Susan as they, uh, with this transition for them. Okay, other announcements. Um, the community uh, picnic that was being planned for September is, has been canceled. Um, Helen Cox passed away, and her service is going to be uh, on the 28th at 12. It's going to be a graveside service, uh, and then they'll have a dinner here uh, afterwards. Saturday is our walk for hope and healing in the canyon. It starts off at noon in Detroit at City Hall, then moves at 2 o'clock. We'll be in Gates. We'll meet at the City Hall there. All of them is the City Hall. Then at 4 for Mill City and 6 for, uh, for Lyons and Mahama. So if you'd like to participate in that, in any of those, you can... Uh, uh, I'd encourage you to do that, but especially to encourage you for the Mill City and Gates to be able to um, spend some time praying. We are uh, the the prayer walk in Gates is about eight tenths of a mile, which I know for some of you that could be difficult. So we're going to have the van there uh, for people to 
uh, who, who aren't able to walk that distance to write in, to pray for our community, to pray for the families, to pray for the churches, for our city council. Uh, and we'll, we'll do our prayer walk, meet back at, the, uh, uh, at City Hall, and then we will have um, um, a t time of, of worship with the, some songs and then some, uh, some specific prayer areas that we can all pray for. So that's this Saturday um, at, at 2 here at Gates. Next week, our winter hours uh, start, so it'll be 9.45 for Sunday school, and worship is at 11. Carolyn has an announcement we, about the uh, uh, Wynema uh, auction. So if, uh, if you're like me and haven't registered yet, you should do that. And... The van's going to leave here at 9 o'clock on the 14th. Jim so thankfully posted for me last week. Uh, I'm Carolyn Lichleiter. I've been here for about three or four weeks, so you probably don't really remember who I am. <laughs> anyway, she's the lady that always has something to say. Anyway, I gave out some of these little flyers uh, in regard to the auction, and it tells about it. It's September 14th. Mike said he's going to drive the van. If you would like to go to the beach and spend two, <coughs> two nights in either camp housing or take your RV to their RV park, it would be free to you. And the auction is on Saturday. So um, pick up one of these. If you didn't get one, uh, we need to provide some things to auction for them to auction off. You can't have an auction without items. In years previous, they have had what they called the silent auction. And it was um, <laughs> people donated items, and they ended up with a lot of um, items that they had to dispose of because they didn't get purchased. Uh, kind of like a garage sale does. So this year they're asking for different kinds of items and it tells it on here. There's also a website and if you don't get answers there, call them up. Say, you know, what is this all about? So I encourage you, um, I'm gonna encourage this person down here that, <laughs> that has bought things that he thought he just really needed and never opened or used that that might be something that you could donate. Um, it happens we impulse buy occasionally, I think. <laughs> Are you? Mike's laughing. It must be him. Uh-huh. So uh, if you have any questions, you can ask Joe or I. Uh, we hope to see a number of you there. It's a beautiful camp. If you haven't been there, at least take the opportunity to, to go and, and see what they're doing with adult groups. As This weekend is their... Um, Labor Day family camp, so they have camp there this weekend. But the kids that are impacted, we have two son and two grandsons that married gals that they met at camp. So it's it's a good place. It, God is there. He is he is working there on those uh, individuals that come to that camp. Thanks. It's right on the beach. Right. Yes. From here to the wall to the beach. <laughs> Joe has something he wants to share. Oh, 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 he didn't tell me that. Oh, he's going up front. Oh, no. Careful. I told Mike that he could edit, edit his uh, sermon. It, it doesn't need to be near as long because I'm going to take up most of his time. Uh, we went to Durango, Colorado. We got all our family there. And it was a great time, and it was for the celebration of two things, 60 years anniversary and Carolyn's upcoming birthday. So we had a great time, but I'd like to talk a little bit about our anniversary. 
I realize that 60 years is really on the, how, how would I say it? It doesn't happen very often. Things getting in the way. Uh, things happen. So I told someone after so many congratulations, I said, I don't know if we're, uh, if we're bragging or harassing. Could be either one, because a lot of people say, well, you know, we, we, we haven't had that kind of luck or that kind of re end result. I would like to talk about milestones. We had one when we got married. We didn't think too much about how it would be down the road and how far. We just know that we made a commitment there. I think God works in our lives even when we don't know it. I come home one day and I told my wife, I said, I'm tired of paying rent. I don't want to get a new house with a 30-year mortgage. I found an old place that's up for back taxes. We can buy it and fix it up and have our own little house all paid for. So we endeavored that. I drove truck 10, 12 hours a day, come home, worked every night till 10.30 or so, and got up at four and did that all summer. And we got moved in, it wasn't really finished, it was livable. And our children were small, and somebody invited them to Sunday school class. I don't know how many of you have ever had this experience, but it's not too long after your children go to Sunday school class that they have a little program that you get invited to. I'm happy to say we got invited. And we started attending church services, and suddenly I realized that, hey, I made a commitment to God, but I haven't followed through on much of it at all. My wife heard the word. She was baptized in the Idana Church. Not in the Idana Church. We had to come to Mill City because they didn't have a baptism. <laughs> Baptismal, I guess it is. So... As I heard the word, I realized I had a debt that I could not pay. I would never be debt free. Not in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. I had to say, Jesus, only you can pay my debt. And I think that that's something that we all need to continue to think about. Because uh, things come along. Things happen. We will never, ever stand before Jesus on our own merits. But we can really trust in him. That's all I got to say, Mike. You can go ahead and finish it up. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Any other announcements? Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> not, not about you, Joe, but I, <laughs> I had to read a lot more than I, I, I like to with, with announcements. So we're going to, uh, if our memory verse for this, this month that's going to be our scripture reading since it's part of the scripture uh, that I'm going to be preaching for, with, from. So let's say this together. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 12. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we know that, the, that our battle isn't against people, but it's against Satan and the evil that's in the world. But God, we thank you that we, you have already won the victory through Jesus Christ. And we stand in that victory today, and we bring you our worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
since we're talking about uh, battles and armor, our children's song that we're starting off today is Lord's Army. Do you guys remember that song? Oh, I'm so glad it has motion. So up you go. We got to march. <laughs> we like this one. I haven't done it for a while. This is cowboy style, so you got to march with your bowed legs because you're on a horse. So here we go, here we go. a brand new song and some of you have it and you'll learn it we'll sing it for a couple of every weeks Be strong in the lord
It's so nice to know we're not in the battle alone, isn't it? <laughs> you can be seated. Thank you. Okie dokie. From uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, the 28th verse, a uh, familiar passage. Uh, the Apostle Paul goes and says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and uh, uh, drink of the cup. Uh, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, and for this cause many are weak and sickly among you. For if, you would, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Kind of harsh stuff, so we'll soften it down here with the best from the Reader's Digest. And uh, this is from uh, things that had been written and, and uh, gathered together by the time I was about four years old. And there's a fellow that was named Fulton Orsler. And uh, he commented that one spring morning when I was a small boy, my mother dressed me up in my Sunday best. And this is back in the 20s or 30s by that time. And warned me, do not leave the front steps we'll be uh, walking on over to your aunt's place before we go to church. So I waited obediently until the baker's son from the corner shop came along and called me a sissy. <laughs> then I sprang from the steps and slammed him a good one across the year. But he showed a remarkable resiliency and shoved me into a mud puddle. And uh, the, the white shirt that I had on got covered with slime and the stocking that I'd pulled up now had a bloody hole in the knee. And I began to cry, uh, but my grief uh, was suddenly forgotten, for I heard the tinkling of the bells. And down the street, a peddler came with a green cart, and they actually say this, I'm not making this up, the hokey pokey ice cream man, <laughs> one cent for a scoop. So you know this was a way back. Forgetting my disobedience, I ran into the house and begged my mother for a penny. I'll never forget her answer. Look at yourself. You're in no condition to ask for anything. Well, many a year went by, and then it dawned on me uh, am I myself in condition to ask of God anything when uh, the time comes? And another little story that they had at the time was about a fellow that had, he was from the First Nations here uh, on this continent, and he went off from his tribe, the Hurons, and he got educated in the city schools, and he became an attorney. And then one fine day, you know, he was able to take a vacation. He went back to the green forest, and he'd got himself a guide from the area because uh, he in an unfamiliar area. And the guide noticed that before dinner, in the evenings, he'd disappear for an hour or so. And he got curious because this had happened two or three nights, so he trails him. 
and he discovers him in a clearing and he makes, he gets a couple of rocks together and a log and gets a fire going, he makes another place over on the other side of the fire and uh, the guide comes up and he motions stay back and he prepares another place and then lets him sit and the guide, they sit quietly for quite some time. And he says, after we returned to camp and had eaten supper, the Indian explained to me the mystery. When I was a child, my mother taught me to go off by myself at the end of the day and make a place for a visit with the Great Spirit. And I was to think back over my actions and thoughts of the day. And if there was anything of which I was ashamed, I must tell the Great Spirit I was sorry and ask for strength to avoid that mistake again. And then I would sleep better that night. And it's been years since I'd slept so well, the Indian fellow said. And so today, I think there was this remark reminding us that we're waiting to take the emblems together. And I think that you see how the two stories might be applied to our own lives. And so the Apostle Paul, also from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, Take of this, this is my body broken for you. He said to do it in remembrance of him. And in the same manner, he took the cup. Remember, it was the Passover cup. But he said to think of it in a new way, that this is the New Testament of my blood, and that as often as you do it, remember me. Shall we pray? As we were reminded earlier, there is no way that um, we can come on our own merit to you. But we are grateful that uh, you have set up this remembrance and these reminders that there is mercy and grace and that you paid the penalty for us and that you ask that we remember you, and that we present the good news that in you there is forgiveness and abundance of life. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Very good communion meditation. Uh, I'm filling in for Mike Bell, and I thought I was supposed to be doing that. So uh, should I give him another one? <laughs> but I won't. I just want to remind you all that uh, as we come together uh, about the great blessings that the Lord has heaped upon us. Um, I've been a member of this church for about 40 years, and when we first came here, we had two Sunday classrooms and uh, another room that was the fellowship hall, and then the sanctuary that handled, would hold about 60 people. Now, there's been a lot of changes, and uh, without the Lord, we would have never reached this uh, pinnacle. And so I just want to give, I want to give thanks to him monetarily and spiritually. You bow with me.
Our dearest Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your blessings, for the joy that you bring into our lives. And when we think of all of the ones that have come before us, how you have blessed them and, and continue to um, help us to share your word throughout the world. I ask that you bless each gift and each giver, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be our scripture reading, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the, in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayers and petitions, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with joy. We come with gladness, Father. We come in worship. Father, we want to uplift some people in uh, before your throne room of grace. We uh, pray for uh, Jean Childress and, uh, and the loss of his son Casey three years ago, just uh, watch over him, the whole family. Be with them as he, as he has a stent put in this week and praying that that would be successful. Lord, we uh, pray for the Ruperts and the health issues that they have been um, facing. We ask that you touch your healing hand upon them both, Lord. Uh, just walk with them. God, I thank you so much for uh, Brian and Susan Fry and their, ch and their children and their 16 years in Papua New Guinea and uh, the work that's going on there in Bible translation in, in evangelism and church planting. So, God, I just pray that you would uh, wrap this family in your arms as, they, uh, as they're working to, uh, on moving. And you know the plans that you have for them. But I thank you for their dedicated service. And even though they won't be on the mission field, you're going to give them a new one in some other country where they can let their light shine and be part of a church. And so we just, we just ask to use them, continue to use them in a mighty way. Pray for Vic and Ginny Lou. Continue. We just ask for healing 
for both of them, God. Just let them know how much we miss them and, and just asking that uh, you would provide for them, Lord. Thank you for answering our prayers concerning Ellen and her heart procedure and just ask that she, uh, she would continue to recover and uh, just to be able to feel much better. And we'll bring Brian Mooney before you and Gina and thank you that Brian is able to come home, but we pray that he would be able to get the use of his legs back, uh, that you would... God, that you'd just heal his body, be with Gina, as, help her as she has her own health concerns and trying to take, take care of Brian. And God, I, I thank you uh, for the testimony that Joe shared with us and, uh, about their 60th anniversary and about people who touched their lives and invited their kids to Sunday school. God, to help us to be those people in, in others, people's lives in our community. Now, Lord, just uh, be with us as we look into your word, that we might be faithful to your word, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we... As we take a look at Ephesians, I've been preaching through that, and I last week I talked about the the battle that we that we're in, and that it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against Satan and the powers of evil, and we see Satan and that evil all around us, and we know that at times it seems like evil is winning. But we need to realize that we are coming from a place of victory, aren't we? Victory that's already been won when Jesus died on the cross because of our sin. Victory over death and being that death being a separation from uh, from God, and the when we we think about this world and what's going on, God is calling His people to go into battle again, not against other people, but against the evil that's in this world. Satan is very real. In fact, John in Revelation 12 talks about Satan rebelled against, how Satan rebelled against God and was cast out. And Daniel wrote about Satan's angels uh, struggled against God's angels for the control of of the affairs of a nation. And so we need to realize that the spiritual forces are there. They're trying to defeat us in our walk with God. They're trying to defeat us in, our, in living victoriously in righteous lives. In verse 13... It says, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Stand for firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And to when you, uh, the Romans, Paul, later on, uh, in fact, in verse 20, he talks about that he is in chains right then. And he was in prison in, in, in Rome. So he was seeing soldiers every day. And he is telling us that we need to put on the armor of God. 
the belt of truth. And the belt for the Roman soldiers was what kind of held everything together. And, and that their sword would hang from that um, and, and that their, their uh, breastplates would, would be, be holding into place. But it, it is the, the uh, having girded your loins with truth. It is so important that we realize that God has supplied us with some things so that we can battle against evil, that we don't have to be afraid of what's going on in the world. In fact, Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And unless we practice the truth, we cannot use the word of truth in taking up the, the sword of the Spirit. Jesus is the truth. His word is true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And people will say, well, that's kind of excluding all the other religions, isn't it? Yes, it is. But I'm not excluding them. Jesus did. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's why we support missionaries that are in Papua New Guinea. Is because... We believe that Jesus is the only way to have our sins forgiven, for us to have the hope of eternal life and to spend eternity with God. And so, because of that, we, we send missionaries out and support those missionaries so that they can go and tell what the truth is about who Jesus Christ is, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that he died on the cross because of our sin, and that we can be forgiven. Oh, we need the truth today, don't we? Now more than ever. We need people who will stand on the Word of God. And not just say, yes, I believe that the Bi in the Bible, but actually opening the Bible up and studying it and reading it and praying through it so that we understand the truth of God, of who God is. And as we go through these, this different armor, we need to realize that what we're doing is we're putting on Christ in our life. Jesus was the truth. He wants us to be truth. He wants us to Share the truth with other people. He also wants us to put, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the Romans, their breastplate would have two parts, one that covered their front, one the back, and then it would tie together on the sides. And... God's word tells us, Paul says, we are putting on the breastplate of righteousness. It isn't our own righteousness because we're not righteous, are we? We are
are putting on the righteousness that God has given to us because he is righteous, because Jesus is. It symbolizes the believer's righteousness in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.21 as well as Christ's righteousness. Satan is the accuser, but he cannot accuse the believer who is living a godly life in the power of the Holy Spirit. The life we live either forfeits us, fortifies us, not forfeits. The life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attack or makes it easier for him to defeat us. Righteousness, purity, holiness, putting on that breastplate. It doesn't mean that we're never going to sin again. It doesn't mean that we're going to not fail and fall. What it does mean is that we recognize our righteousness comes from God. That His holiness, Christ being perfect, never sinning, is why we can put on His righteousness because He's paid the price for us. And as we do the right thing, as we follow God's word and follow his commandments, we are able to defend ourselves from Satan's attacks, aren't we? And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the Roman soldier would had a couple of different foot, uh, uh, sandals for their feet. Some of them uh, were kind of like cork boots uh, when they would go into battle so that they could grip better. But the Romans had built it had a vast empire, and so their soldiers had to, to march many, many miles from one place to the other. And so they would have more like a boot that they were ready, that would make them ready to go on those long marches. And, got, and Paul tells us here that we um, should shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When Sarah and I first got married, I was a little appalled at her, what she spent on shoes. <laughs> and because for me, I always bought the cheapest shoes that I could find. Um, and until uh, I made, I don't, I don't think it was a smart comment to say to her, but it was a smart aleck comment about it. Uh, and she asked me, Mike, how many pairs of tennis shoes have you had to buy? And she goes, I've had mine for years. And so I kind of, changed my mind about uh, about how much money that I spend on on shoes. I still don't like to buy them, but I do like to have quality ones that will last more than a few months. And God wants us to have put on our feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? What is the preparation of the gospel of peace? Well, when we think about 
our faith, when we think about what we stand on, God is saying that the gospel of peace is something that we need to stand, that will help us withstand the attacks from Satan. Because we have peace from God. Peace is something when, we, when you think about the peace of God is that when I think of that, I think about the cares of the world and the, the uncertainties. And yet God can give me a peace in my heart that shouldn't be there if I was doing everything under my own power and my own ability. But God gives me a peace knowing that, hey, the battle, the victory's already been won. We do have to fight battle, some battles, but he's going to walk with us through those dark times. He's going to encourage us He's going to use us for his kingdom and his glory. And then he expects us to go walking with the gospel of peace, sharing that gospel, telling other people about who Jesus is about how, what God has done for us. Sometimes we, people, we tend to think, well, people will get afraid of sharing about your faith. Thinking, well, I don't know enough scripture. I, I'm not confident in, 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 in doing that. Guess what? God has give, given us all a testimony, right? Of what God has done in our lives. Part of, uh, part of that, what Joe shared, is part of his testimony about what happened in the past and how God used other people. And so we can learn more scripture, but more important, importantly, we can love other people, can't we? And we can talk about how God answered our prayers, how God used some bad things in our past, but how he brought about good. That's part of who we are, part of our history, part of our testimony to other people. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isaiah talks about how uh, if we wear the shoes of the gospel, then we have beautiful feet. Um, beautiful are the feet of them who brings good news. So we have our feet shod with the gospel of peace, and then it says that we are to take the shield of faith. The shield was a, a larger shield, probably four feet tall by two and a half feet wide. It was, the Romans would use it not just for protecting an individual sh uh, soldier, but in formation they could lock those shields together and, and march towards the enemy. And so when we think about that shield of faith, it is not just a shield, it's not even a shield of my own personal faith, but it is a shield of faith for our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
as we serve God together, as we work side by side, the shield would protect the soldier from spears and arrows. And we are, in the, in the faith that, we're, that they're talking about, it isn't the saving faith as far as when we came to know Jesus Christ, but rather it's a living faith, trusting in the promises and the power of God. Faith is a defensive weapon which protects us from Satan's fiery darts. And it protects other brothers and sisters in Christ as well. In addition, taking at verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. That shield of faith. What are some of the darts that Satan hurls at us, those flaming, fiery darts? Well, a lot of times it's doubt, doubt of who God is. It's doubt. Another dart is, does, does God really love us? The doubt of, am I really forgiven? Can God really use someone like me? That shield of faith in the almighty God, the all-powerful God, the one who works in us, the one who uses us to work in other people's lives to make a difference. If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> and, and as we think about as we think about that shield of faith and putting our faith and our trust in a God who's the creator of the universe, we're putting our faith and our trust in a God who we are created in his image. Scripture describes that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That shield of faith that we have the faith in a God who loved us enough to send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. A faith that needs to remain strong and firm but it's a faith that we need to share with our brothers and sisters in Christ, encouraging them, loving them. And then he says, take up the helmet of salvation. And that helmet of salvation, Satan wants to attack our minds, doesn't he? And he did that with Eve because when he, uh, he attacked her mind in, in, in asking to get her to question God. Did God really say? And so when we put on that helmet of salvation, understanding that we are saved, we've been redeemed, The helmet refers to a mind controlled by God. In 2 Peter 3.18, we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we put on that helmet of salvation? 
so that our mind is controlled by God. We have to be careful about what we put in our minds, what we think about, what we meditate on. The saying, garbage in, garbage out. We teach that to our kids. We may not exactly say that. Sometimes we might. But do we as adults realize that? The things that we see on TV, the movies that we watch, the magazines that we read, are we keeping our focus on God or the things of the world? Do we spend more time in the things of the world than worshiping God, than reading his word, than singing songs of praise to him? Finally, it says to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we know that God's word is compared, the sword is compared to God's word. But the word of God is, can divide both the, uh, the marrow, the bone and marrow. We think of Peter who took up a sword to, and struck off the, the high priest's servant's ear in per, trying to protect Jesus. And yet, we know just a short time later, Peter denied Jesus three times. I don't even know the guy. Where a sword is meant to to hurt and kill, the sword of the Spirit wounds to heal and to give life. Some people have tried to use the word of God, the sword of the spirit, as a weapon to hurt people. And so we have to weld the sword of the spirit very carefully. Taking a stand firm on what is right and what's wrong, what is sinful and what's not, what is righteousness and what is unrighteousness, what is good and what is evil. But as we do that, we have to be doing it on, for, with a purpose in mind of loving people, about caring that people are lost so that they might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As we think about, as we think about putting these thing, this armor on, we're putting on Jesus being truth. We're putting on His righteousness. We're putting on His peace. We are taking up the shield of faith that He has given to us. We're putting on the salvation that comes in knowing who Jesus Christ is, that he is Lord and that he is Savior. And then we take up the word of God as a sword to proclaim to the nations who Jesus is. And how do we go forward as soldiers of God? As men and women who are equipped to do battle against evil forces. Well, the next verse tells us 
with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. When Nehemiah was, went back to Israel to build the wall, they, several things that they did, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book, a book about how those around them tried to discourage the people, tried to instill fear in them, and yet Nehemiah said that they watched and they prayed. And here it tells us, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. We have to be on alert. We can't, as we pray, most of the time we pray with our eyes closed, but it's okay to pray with your eyes open, especially if you're driving down the road. But being alert to what God is already doing in people's lives, being alert to Satan and the evil that's around us so that we're not easily defeated. Watch and pray. And then as because of the, the forces that, that were trying to, to discourage them from rebuilding the wall to where they were going to attack them, Nehemiah had them uh, hold, in one hand they had their sword, in the other hand they had their trowel. We need to be alert. We need to... Um, see what's going on around us. And we need to be praying for each other. Paul, we would consider Paul one, the, the greatest apostle because of all his writings, because they wrote about his, uh, his missionary journeys. But Paul asked for prayer for himself. He said, pray for me. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. If Paul needed prayer, so do we, don't we? And we need to pray for each other. Praying that so that we would not fall, praying for uh, and interceding on others' behalf. Praying that we would have boldness in the words that we say and the actions that we take. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And if you're here today and you do not have that peace of God in your life because you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can come forward to do that, to have your sins forgiven, to be able to have, know that you're going to be in heaven with him. For those of us who who have made that decision already, do you know where your armor is right now? Are there some parts of that armor that we need to go find and put on? So that we can serve God to the best of our abilities. Come as we stand and we sing.
Father, we thank you for the, the, the full armor of God. That as we put on Christ, we go forth into the world, Father, to serve together, to be a light, to be bold in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 